Hi there, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar on key factors for half bridge and gate driver measurements. Before we get started, I'd just like to let everyone know that this webinar will be recorded and you'll be receiving an email afterwards with the recording. So if you can go ahead and share it with anyone you think would be interested or rewatch it, then that would be great. If you're interested in any of the other webinars we'll be hosting or to download any of the free resources we have available, such as white papers or application notes, please go ahead and visit testforce.com academy and you'll find everything you need right there. If during the webinar you have any questions, just make sure that you ask them in the Q&A section in the right hand side menu bar of the dashboard and Wilson Lee from Tektronix will be sure to get all of those questions as we get to the end of the presentation. I'd like to introduce Wilson Lee, Technical Marketing Manager at Tektronix and Wilson focuses heavily on design and design engineer engagement with the RF wireless, industrial power, and industrial automation markets. And now without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Wilson. Thank you for attending today's webinar on half bridge and gate driver measurement. The half bridge is widely used across many applications in the field of power electronics and is the basic circuit used to convert electrical energy efficiently. On modern designs, the benefits of the half bridge can only be realized when the half bridge circuit and the gate driver circuit, along with the layout, are all properly designed and optimized. It is impossible to tune and optimize the circuit when using improper measurement techniques as well as using improper measurement equipment. When measured results do not agree with expected results, it may be difficult to extract meaningful details regarding the device under test. To make things worse, waveforms can dramatically change depending on the positioning of a probe, leaving more questions than answers. This webinar will provide an overview of test methodologies to help designers test with greater accuracy, consistency, reliably, and with confidence. The requirements for efficiencies and power densities will vary based on the application. Design requirements for optimizing price versus performance while obtaining the desired energy efficiency and power densities will determine the design topology and thus what measurement equipment and techniques should be considered. Now the development challenge on wideband gap devices uh, may also differ from traditional silicon. So for example, silicon carbide typically targets higher power, that being more than 10 kilowatt applications, or gallium nitride uh, devices and its topologies is appropriate for mid-power applications, that being uh, less than 10 kilowatts but over 5 kilowatts, and uh, particularly are looking for ultra-high speed applications. With all that in mind, this webinar will focus on the most common metrics as you see from this slide above and the design requirements and will not necessarily provide insights or recommendations for specific design implementations. Accurate power measurements depend on the measurement system's performance and ranging from voltage handling, common mode rejection, connectivity, temperature handling capabilities, and the ability to measure very small currents. Now despite the ever-increasing power design requirements, True advancements in tests and measurements have been minimal at best. In some cases, this has forced designers such as yourselves to make custom measurement solutions or to do without making the measurements. Now, many of these measurements at the most basic level, the measurement solutions require an oscilloscope and the corresponding probes. This webinar will focus on proper probe selections as well as probing techniques because the oscilloscope is rarely the issue in making accurate and reliable power measurements. Rather, it is typical the probe which is the limiting factor. Various probe types, their capabilities, and the importance of measurement considerations will be highlighted when measuring half bridge and gate drivers and uh, all considerations related to their designs. Most oscilloscopes ship with a set of passive probes. These probes uh, can have varying performance characteristics, voltage ranges, input impedance, and grounding solutions. Passive probe 
can be used to measure signals that are ground reference to the scope, so they are more effective at the low side device and their measurements. When making measurements with the passive probe, it's very important to understand the effects of insufficient rise time, large input capacitance, and ground lead inductance, uh, particularly because um, you are ground connected to ground it is also important just to be aware of ground loops and learning how to avoid them to ensure that you are truly grounded in uh, this selection of single end of probes. Now when considering how much performance you want in your choice of probe, most people want to know about the probe's bandwidth. In fact, the, the conventional thinking is the belief around of the higher the bandwidth means the higher the performance. I'm here to say that this is not necessarily true. And by that I mean that uh, bandwidth definitely is important. Bandwidth defines the frequency at which the peak-to-peak -peak amplitudes of a sine wave uh, is measured, uh, particularly uh, from the actual sine wave end-to-end uh, -end amplitude. Most users aren't measuring sine waves, though. So instead, uh, they're really wanting to display and measure uh, their signals under consideration as seen as a function over time. So it's interesting that the bandwidth is the banner specification for performance as defined in the frequency domain, when again, most people are wanting to actually uh, see what's happening in the time domain. So the performance metric users should pay very close attention to uh, is the probe's rise time capabilities. Most people are interested in time domain measurements such as rise time and fall time. So the rise time can be calculated from the bandwidth, but this calculated value should also be questioned. The only way to reliably know the rise time and fall time response of a measurement system is actually to measure it uh, within a step signal that is much faster than the signal which you're measuring. Tektronix uses this methodology for defining the rise time values for all its probes. A measurement system with insufficient rise time will have a step response aberration as sh shown in this uh, example, which you can see uh, abnormalities such as rounding as well as drooping in uh, your signal measurement. It can be very difficult to know these aberrations are actually from the measurement system or from the device in the test and can only truly be known if the user has characterized the, the measurement system. So again, to avoid these measurement uh, errors, a user should select a probe which is much fast, has much faster rise time uh, than the actual device under test. Let's uh, take this conversation of bandwidth versus real rise time further. Does your passive probe have enough, quote-unquote, bandwidth? This is uh, particularly Im important when considering the trend in power electronics is moving towards faster switching times with fewer losses uh, resulting in smaller, much more efficient designs. As transistors realize faster switching speeds, uh, they drive increasingly uh, critical complex requirements for gate drivers. So highlighted in this slide, on the right hand of the slide, you'll see uh, uh, an industry a provider of a high-speed uh, FET, which boasts some very fast rise and fall times, uh, with some of the typical values faster than a nanosecond, which is fast. Now, accurately measuring the rise and fall times of this driver uh, would actually require a measurement system which is even faster uh, in rise time, uh, particularly in the case where you may have hard switching and the need to drive uh, the switching uh, requirements on this FET. So as illustrated on the left-hand side of the slide, the measurement in, uh, of rise and fall times in this screen capture, which we've measured using a Tektronix uh, TPP1000, our standard 1 gigahertz passive probe you actually can see from the scope measurement that we have in the case of uh, hard switching requirements, a rise time specification uh, that is uh, actually uh, just nearly half of what is in the specification as seen on the right. 
Now, we're only able to see this uh, just north of 500 picosecond measurement because the uh, passive probe being used has a rise time specification of less than 450 picoseconds. If this measurement was made using a probe with slower rise time, uh, such as a 500 megahertz probe, the high frequency content located at the front corner of this waveform would have been rounded off. And so simply the, the measurement requirement also goes beyond s simply uh, bettering the rise and fall time of the signal. Typically you need to consider that the signal under test will also include complex spectral components which again uh, require a probe that is faster in spec than the device under test. Passive probes that come with the oscilloscope uh, shipments typically come with a, a half foot uh, lead length. Now a, a longer ground lead length is useful in that it allows uh, you, uh, your design team, to, to navigate around your bench equipment. While this is convenient, uh, the longer ground lead does have an inherent trade-off uh, of performance for that convenience. By that I mean it's important to be aware of the possible problems that can arise from uh, improper grounding and what happens with longer lead length. The probe can uh, be modeled as a simple RLC circuit and the ring frequency is a function of the probe's ground lead uh, and the probe's uh, input capacitance. So the probe's ground lead inductions combined with the, the probe dip's capacitance and signal source capacitance forms a resonant circuit that can cause ringing at certain frequencies. So in short, as highlighted in matrix in the lower right-hand part of uh, this slide, uh, the longer the, the lead length, uh, the more induction uh, that will be caused uh, to the measurement to have uh, ringing at low frequencies. So you can see standard passive probes with 9.5 puffs of uh, inherent input capacitance along with a convenient half foot ground uh, lead length uh, will actually create a, a ground lead inductance of 150 nano henrys and uh, actually create a ringing frequency of 133 megahertz. Now that same probe input, but using a half-inch ground spring, will reduce that uh, lead inductance to roughly about 10 nanohenries, uh, improve uh, the ringing frequency out to beyond the 500 megahertz. It's interesting to point out that with Tektronik's uh, standard 1 gigahertz probes, uh, with uh, industry-leading uh, low inherent a capacitance of less than four puffs of capacitance, you can see automatically the better measurement accuracy that you have, uh, whether using the standard half foot ground lead uh, or if you move to a half inch ground spring, which uh, in the uh, bottom of the screen you'll see that the uh, ringing frequency uh, improves uh, up to beyond of 800 megahertz. When measuring current, many designers are turning to a sense resistor instead of a current probe, simply because the inductance from the wire loop needed to measure with a current probe uh, perturbs the circuit itself. Often there is a resistor already in the design in series between the gate driver and the gate. To minimize the insertion impedance in the circuit under test, the resistance of the sense resistor is kept very small which means that the voltage drop across the sense resistor will also be very small. Now the current is a calculated value by taking the measured value of the voltage drop across the sense resistor and then dividing it by the known resistance of the resistor itself. So placing a sense resistor on the low side a connection usually means one terminal of the sense resistor is at ground. The primary difference between the low side and the high side placement is the low side placement can reduce or effectively eliminate the common mode voltage, which appears simultaneously and is in phase on either side of the current sense resistor. This is why the low side sense resistor placement is often recommended, especially in high voltage situations. In high current applications, ground bounces 
shows up as a common mode signal and something to keep in mind. One technique to break ground loops is to quote unquote float the scope or quote unquote float the circuit being measured. Floating refers to breaking the connection to ground earth by opening the safety ground conductor either at the device under test or uh, at the scope level itself. Floating the scope potentially allows users to make differential measurements between two test points which are not ground referenced with a single ended probe using a, uh, the probe tip and the ground lead. This is possible because the scope ground has been defeated. Now it's very important to raise that this practice is inherently dangerous as it defeats the, the protection from electrical shock and can damage the measurement equipment due to power supply transformers wind, uh, windings that are breaking down. Now, floating may be useful for some measurements, uh, particularly at very low frequencies. However, users should be aware that without a low impedance ground connection, radiated and conducted emissions from the scope will interfere with the measurements in the form of noise. More so at higher frequencies, severing the ground may not break the ground loop as the floating circuit is coupled to ground earth through uh, large stray capacitance. This capacitance will cause significant waveform distortions and inaccuracies at higher frequencies. Also, the reference slide that you see has significant capacitance to ground. So this high capacitance reference connection can damage some of the circuits or uh, worse, develop into an even more unsafe condition to the user itself. So the waveforms on the slide shown uh, uh, show a floating measurement uh, on a high uh, side gate driver. The ringing and distortion is quite obvious and the screenshot uh, shows a very large 28 uh, volt overshoot. Let's talk about pseudo differential measurements. Most scopes have a math function which allows design users to make a pseudo differential measurement. The differential measurement is accomplished by making two ground reference measurements and using the scope's math subtraction between the two scope channels. So in this example above, we are subtracting the waveform on channel two from the waveform on channel one. And the resultant uh, red waveform is the resulting math uh, created by the differential signals. While limited in performance, this technique may be adequate for some low frequency measurements with low common mode signals. Now for proper operations, uh, both inputs must be set uh, to the same scale factor. Both probes must be identical models and closely matched. Any mismatch between probe, the probe's attenuations or gain uh, any propagation delays, uh, and any frequency response uh, will result in less accurate measurements. Common mode rejection ratio here is rather poor, particularly at higher frequencies, and high common mode signals will overdrive the scope's input. It uh, also ha happened to tie up two uh, scope channels. So observing the, the math waveforms, which is a differential measurement uh, on a high side gate driver, there is quite a bit of ringing, and the common mode error is swamping out the measurement itself. High voltage differential probes are a preferred solution for safety as well as uh, accuracy in measuring differential voltages in the presence of large common mode voltages up to thousands of volts. Because these probes are a true differential, both of the inputs are of high impedance. And with the uh, balance, uh, low input capacitance of high voltage differential probes, any point in the circuit can be safely probed with either lead and uh, provide the, the lower loading to the circuit under test. However, uh, please bear in mind uh, that around the common misperception that the differential probe is actually floating. Uh, the fact is traditional differential probes are based on differential amplifiers which are connected to ground earth. This ground connection um, limits the common mode re uh, voltage range and causes the common mode voltage frequency derating. 
creating ground loops and um, ultimately limiting uh, common mode rejection. So for higher uh, perform uh, performance powered devices, a traditional high voltage differential probe is uh, more than likely not the best option for measuring at the high side due to its inefficient common mode re rejection capabilities at these higher frequencies. An important topic that needs to be well understood when using uh, a differential probe is how a probe's poor, inadequate common mode rejection can cause misleading and uh, or potentially even useless measurements. When evaluating gate driver performance in a half bridge, most people measure at the low side and ignore the high side measurement. Mostly because measuring at the low side is possible because it's ground referenced and it's not floating. When you're measuring the, the low side VGS, you're looking to ensure that design is meeting a, a particular set of specs and or has the characteristic waveform shape um, that you've been working on through the bulk of the design. Now referring back to our earlier discussions in this webinar on bandwidth uh, and proper uh, grounding, single-ended probes can lead to misleading results as you get to faster and faster s uh, switching. Now an alternative solution is to use a high performance, high voltage differential probe that minimizes the effects uh, in that it, uh, based on its good shielding, uh, lower inductance, and its high common mode rejection capabilities. Let's talk about which common ground should be used. This is in particularly important with the number of ground choices that today's semiconductor suppliers provide. So even with a single circuit board, where you ground your probe can make a, a very dramatic difference. Uh, with today's high switching speeds and high currents, there can be significant differences between ground reference points, again, just within a single-sided circuit board. The takeaway from this slide is that you should always choose uh, the ground as close as possible to the device under test. This is especially important in cases where you have significant current flowing through the grounds. So the slide here attached is simply try to highlight uh, that closest to device should be your grounding point. So on the right hand side you'll see that the, in the top half of uh, the chart where the switch node measurement and grounding position uh, is different than the gate source measurement and its grounding position. So something to keep in mind as uh, you work through your designs and choosing your ground positions. So as we begin to talk about high side voltage measurements, uh, these uh, high side gate driver uh, measurements is extremely difficult to characterize. Simply that the high side driver outputs and local grounds are tied to the switch node, as highlighted in this slide, which is floating up and down between ground and the input supply voltage. Because of this uh, rapidly changing common mode rejection, the high side driver is literally impossible to measure without superior common mode rejection. So as highlighted in this example, the supply voltage is 600 volts and the gate driver has an output of 15 volts. And we'll use these values over the, the next couple of slides, but you can see as highlighted in the right side of this slide that uh, the difficulty of seeing that 15 volts differential uh, in presence of a 600 volt common mode value. So even uh, high voltage differential probes often fail to provide a good enough representation of uh, the actual signal simply due to its limitation in their common mode rejection ratio. The derating uh, that we've talked about that happens across a frequency, the frequency response, as well as the probe's uh, long input leads. All these limitations are even more pronounced when testing on power devices with ultra fast switching rates and even nominal common mode voltages. Because of the frequency dependence of uh, common mode rejection, most differential probes only list the common mode rejection ratio or CMRR values at DC or low frequencies on the data sheet. Let's take an example of a data sheet of a traditional high voltage probe as seen in the slide above. Now this probe shows a bandwidth of 100 
um, of a 100 megahertz probe, which has sufficient performance for many differential measurements. But when we look more closely in on the common mode rejection numbers in the data sheet, we see that it is only specified at values at DC 60 hertz, a hertz, and then one megahertz. Uh, this is strange and presents us a challenge in that the, the data sheet does not include common mode rejection values for, for frequencies that are higher than one megahertz, given that it is a 100 megahertz probe. So the question we'll carry on to uh, the next slide is, where can you find common mode rejection values for those bandwidths greater than me one megahertz in which often you're working uh, at? Uh, so the, the key is actually to, to look at a probe's uh, manual uh, and then to explore the common mode rejection ratios, plots versus frequencies that probes do have in their manuals. Using the uh, plot on this slide for reference, we can now determine common mode rejection values at greater than one megahertz. So looking at this plot, uh, on the lower uh, left hand of the uh, screenshot, it becomes clear why the higher bandwidths uh, common mode rejection values are emitted from the data sheet. So at 100 megahertz, this probe only has approximately tw 27 dB of common mode rejection ratio, which is um, approximately 22 to 1. So going back to our example a couple of slides ago, of a 600 volts common mode voltage. So we would divide the 600 vo uh, voltage um, by 22. You can see we have approximately 27 volts of common mode error. Another consideration for calculating common mode rejection is accounting for the connection between the probe and the device under test. Most common mode rejection specifications only include the probe and do not in, uh, account at all for the connectivity options, such as large hookup clips, uh, which are included with the probes. The chart on the right hand of this screenshot shows different connectivity options for the Tektronix TIVM and TIVH isolated probes. These models include connectivity options using both MMCX connections as well as square pin connections. Now, while the common mode rejection is extremely high at low bandwidths and using uh, lower uh, attenuation tips, it can be clearly observed that the common mode rejection ratio degrades at higher bandwidths. And using higher attenuation tip cables uh, with square pin connectors. Uh, to take it further, and then shown on the left uh, hand side of uh, the screenshot is uh, the industry compare of LaCroix's high voltage fiber optic probe now using their lowest attenuation 1x tips. At face value, the common mode rejection ratio is good at 60 megahertz, showing a value of minus uh, 57 dB or approximately a, a 707 to 1 uh, ratio. However, the note below uh, the plot indicates that common mode rejection the ejection ratio degrades using higher attenuation tips, and the common mode rejection ratio degradation due to higher attenuation tips is calculated as 20 uh, to the log 10 of the attenuation. So simply uh, when using the 40 volt, 40x attenuation tips, you can see that the common mode rejection degrades by an additional 32 dB, and making the new common mode rejection value uh, 20, uh, minus 25 dB, or approximately 18 to 1. Designers interested in characterizing the entire circuit and with special focus on the high side should turn to a high-performance isolated probe. The TIVM and TIVH series probes from Tektronix offers high performance up to 1 gigahertz, large differential and common mode voltage ranges of up to 60 kV, superior common mode rejection to the full bandwidth of the probe, and excellent probe loading characteristics. Up until now, most designers resorted to some alternative technique when it comes to the high side uh, device measurements, such as 
as we discussed, measuring the low side and referring the results to the high side. Using extensive simulation, examining thermal characteristics, uh, EMI proximity probing, and um, short of all of that, uh, simply trial and error. Now, given some of the great uh, performance characteristics of Tektronik's isolated probes, the only slight limitation for uh, our isolated probes is the differential range, which has a maximum value of 2.5 kilovolts. It's still a, uh, a lot of um, differential voltage capability handling. But for some measurements on silicon carbide or higher power IGPTs, uh, this might be a slight limitation in the measurements on the high side uh, to gate uh, driver. As we speak further about isolated probes, uh, this slide is trying to represent the comparison of measuring the high side gate signal using a traditional high voltage differential probe uh, versus a high performance isolated probe as highlighted in the last couple of slides from Tektronix. The image at the top right shows uh, the ideal represent representation or state in which we're trying to achieve, which simply, as you see on the uh, upper right hand, uh, is the high side the VGS turns on. And uh, the first region uh, is the uh, uh, CGS, uh, uh, gate source charge time, uh, which is followed by the Miller Plateau, which you see in um, the middle of the chart on the upper right hand, um, which is the time required to charge uh, the gate drain Miller capacitance, or C uh, gate drain and is um, VDS uh, dependent. Now, the charge time increases as the VDS increases. But once the channel is in the, uh, conduction, uh, that state of conduction, the, the gate will charge up to its final value, as you see uh, in the slide in the upper right-hand corner. Now, comparing the actual output of the high-voltage differential probe to the ideal turn-on state, it's very difficult to extract uh, meaningful information and make design decisions based on the measurement that you see in the lower left-hand side uh, of this screenshot. Now, it's important to note that the waveforms using a differential probe may change dramatically based on the position of the probe input leads, making re uh, repeatable measurements nearly impossible. Now, that's at the lower right-hand side of uh, the screenshot. An isolated uh, high-voltage measurement system offers the resolution and repeatability required to measure and characterize and optimize the performance of your design. In this uh, waveform screenshot on the lower right-hand side, you can clearly see the Miller Plateau and the correlation of the switch uh, to node transition. It's important to know that if ringing and overshoot are real, uh, so that, in other words, noise is real, and this uh, waveform clearly shows uh, resonance and the signal detail that were previously hidden, ultimately giving you the confidence uh, in that measurement. Because if you don't have confidence in your measurement, it's impossible to optimize the performance, and the, the design itself ends up being overly conservative to stay within specification. Again, in, in summary, uh, a probe's poor common mode rejection capabilities can lead to misleading and even useless measurements. So we talk about the high side measurement, that uh, the importance of this can be seen in uh, considering uh, the interaction between uh, high and low side. By that, uh, I mean that um, at the low side switch, uh, even though it's supposed to be ground reference, it's interesting to see the actual waveform and uh, see how it may affect the high side performance. The waveforms that are captured in this screenshot show that the low side uh, has ringing due to parasitic coupling between the low side switch and the high side gate and the switch node. Uh, uh, this can often occur uh, when you're unable to see the overshoot or the ringing from the high side that may carry over to the low side. And um, there are many things that can happen uh, when we have uh, situations like this. 
you can have simultaneous conduction where both the low and the high sign are turning on at the same time. At a minimum, you'll have um, switching and efficiency loss and degradation to the device. And um, uh, you may have, in a worst case, a catastrophic, catastrophic failure of the device itself. So these are very important considerations, particularly when you look at uh, the, the lower left-hand side of the screenshot uh, and slide uh, in the consideration that the very small uh, time periods between switching, so the dead times, particularly around the gallium nitride devices, have very small time windows and very stringent tolerances where ringing could uh, easily become problematic for the violations uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, the double pulse test uh, can be used uh, to measure the switching features and robustness of power modules in the market. In the screenshot example above, uh, the low side device characteristics of a half bridge can be observed using high performance, single ended probes, and current probes. Characterizing the high side, however, again requires probes with sufficient performance, dy dynamic range, and that common mode rejection capability. Common mode transient immunity, or CMTI, is an important test because of high frequency transients uh, can corrupt data going across an isolated barrier and can alter the output waveform. It's important to understand and measure the susceptibility of these transients. Now, if you want to measure the device CMTI, it makes sense that the measurement system should have superior common mode rejection in the presence of common mode transients. If you're trying to troubleshoot performance during a test, the ideal measurement system must have sufficient performance and common mode rejection. Again, in, as in the uh, double pulse test, uh, the suggested pro for this kind of measurement would be that higher performance isolated probe such as Tektronix TIVM and or TIVH series. In summary, the webinar has uh, covered a great uh, number of things. Uh, simply to say that the measurement challenges uh, on half bridge and gate drivers are numerous. It is very important to have the proper measurement techniques and the measurement solutions to gain the insights which you seek. Often, the issues are not scope-driven, but are based on proper probe selection. And the proper criteria is key. High side gate measurements uh, have enormous amount of complexities. And the webinar has tried to highlight the importance of high common mode rejection capability. And where isolated high voltage differential probes are optimal in the presence of high common mode voltage and enabling accurate, reliable measurement insights of the differential voltage. Tektronix has a TVI-H as well as a TVI-VM galvanic isolated probes which provide up to 60 kV of common mode voltage handling and 2.5 kilovolts of differential voltage measurement capability. We hope that you enjoyed the seminar and we'll cover a couple of additional um, resources which you might find useful in your power measurements and power designs around the half bridge and gate drivers. On the Tektronix website, you'll find additional content on probing solutions required for making accurate measurements on your half bridge and gate driver designs. Uh, under the isolated probe link, there are application notes and videos which go into much more detail regarding the measurements on wideband gap devices. There are also much more information under passive probes regarding how uh, probes' input capacitance can affect measurement accuracy as we discussed through uh, this webinar. Design, troubleshooting, and analysis on your switch mode power supplies, half bridge, and gate driver uh, designs can be supported by our newest mixed signal oscilloscope, our 5 series MSO, and its optional uh, five power analysis uh, suite of application software. In the oscilloscope itself, uh, aside of the eight analog channels and 12 bits of A to C uh, resolution, 
you have an oscilloscope that can go up to 2 gigahertz in bandwidth, has a super fast sampling rate of 6 and a quarter giga samples a second across each channel, up to 125 million uh, records, and a ton of automated power measurements, um, which include from ripple, slew rate, switching loss, safe operating uh, area, power quality, harmonics, and modulation, all in which uh, have simple to, to use um, report generation capabilities. We're pleased to announce our new power conversion demo kit focused around wideband gap-based converters. From this slide, you'll see what's included in the demo kit. Now you can demo the entire kit under one part number, which is centered around the highly unique combination of our ISOVIEW differential probe solutions and our channel dense 5 series MSO. You also have the flexibility to choose or unselect certain optional items which are in the kit so that you can tailor it to your specific power conversion application. Please seek a live chat on our website tech.com and ask about Power Solutions 1. We also wanted to highlight some new probe connectivity solutions that are tied to our very popular TPP-1000, our low capacitance, high bandwidth passive probe. Within the slide, you'll see four distinct adaptive connectivity options that are meant to provide simple but powerfully reliable, easy to use solutions with continued high signal fidelity that goes along with the best-in-class passive probe in its class. Remember, your best scope and measurement insights are only as good as your probing solution. All right, great. Thank you for listening to our webinar on half-bridge and gate driver measurements, everyone. Uh, there was a lot of information there from Wilson, and we have a few questions already that have come into the Q&A box. Just as a reminder, if you have a question of your own, feel free to type it into the Q&A section on the right-hand side of your dashboard, and Wilson will get to answering those. Also, I'm going to post a quick poll up in the dashboard. It will be available for five minutes, so while we're going through the Q&A, feel free to fill in your responses. Uh, if you don't see the poll pop up on your screen, you may need to go to um, the section at the bottom of uh, the video and just there may be three dots where you can click and it will give you the option to select the poll. And then you can submit uh, your answers and responses to a few questions there. Uh, now, Wilson, this is for you. The first question is, I am interested in measurements on multi-phase systems and stacked inverters. Is the Tektronix ISOVIEW system proprietary? And I thought that Tektronix scopes are limited to four channels, but I need more than that. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. I, I think there are a few things there. Um, the ISOVIEW system is proprietary. Uh, understandably, given that it's uh, totally unique, uh, the only one of its kind in the industry, uh, from its galvanically is isolated capabilities uh, to its optically driven ar architecture and all the things, uh, sensor technology within. Uh, now remember that uh, the uh, ISOP probe can handle uh, up to 60 kilovolts of common mold voltage and can measure uh, 2.5 kilovolts of differential voltage uh, based on having that uh, uh, one-of-a-kind superior common mode rejection. So uh, for the audience, uh, just bear in mind that the common mode rejection is actually 100 million to one at 100 megahertz. And uh, across the bandwidth of a gigahertz, uh, 10,000 to one. I think the second thing is I, I just like to remind uh, uh, um, the uh, person in the audience who asked the question that uh, our five series mixed signal oscilloscope does have uh, six and eight channels capability. So uh, additional channels uh, definitely more than enough to to handle uh, any uh, multi-phase uh, power system. 
Interesting. Great. Thanks, Wilson. The next question is, why did Tektronix land on a MMCX connection for the isolated probes? Yeah, the MMCX uh, was pr- um, chosen primarily because uh, it provided, one, the convenience of a small form factor. Uh, it's an industry standard connector uh, that offers uh, very high signal fidelity. And uh, with the, the least amount of guesswork for our design customers of how to uh, fit it onto the board and so on. So standard industry form factor is being one. Uh, the second is uh, the, the solid metal by construction, gold contacts, uh, really provide uh, the best uh, shielding signal path. Uh, and the, the mating MMCX interface offers uh, snap snap in um, connection with kind of the positive retention force uh, to be able to provide uh, the design engineering customer a stable hand-free uh, type of connection. Okay, great. Uh, can the isolated probe be used for more than five millimeter pitch spacing? Yeah, so the uh, TIVH uh, series uh, within the IsoView uh, probes uh, provides square pin style sensor tip uh, cable connection uh, to achieve uh, higher input uh, differential voltage measurement capability. So these uh, tip interfaces um, are designed to offer both uh, ease of connectivity as well as a secure connection. Again, uh, so you're enabled to have uh, hands-free, safe uh, operating, particularly for those customers in the audience that are dealing with a very high voltage. Uh, Now, specific uh, to the question, the square square pin style, um, the center tip cables that are available come in a couple of uh, variants. One is a point uh, one uh, inch or a 2.54 millimeter pitch. Um, which uh, those are typically used in applications uh, up to 600 volts. But we also have a 0.2 inch uh, or or, uh, just slightly over 5 millimeter pitch uh, for those applications up to the maximum handling rate of 2,500 volts. So um, definitely we do have something that uh, is uh, north of 5 millimeters in pitch. That's really helpful. Thanks, Wilson. Maybe, do you think you could provide a brief recap of the key features of these ISOVIEW probes? Yeah, so ISOVIEW, again, is uh, the only one uh, probing solution of its kind in the industry, uh, given its galvanically isolated uh, architecture for differential uh, probe uh, measurements. Um, what's unique about this, it utilizes um, uh, electro-optical sensor technology to convert uh, the input signals uh, to optical modulation. Now the connection is uh, powered over the fiber optic connection. So what design engineers will find is that there's no external power source required. Uh, also, uh, it is uh, spec to handle up to 40 uh, mega ohms of input resistance. Um, so Effectively, this enables very unique capabilities to handle that up to 60 kilovolts of common mold, uh, voltage. Again, uh, very commonly seen uh, high voltages in higher power supplies, particularly the, the, which are using higher power se- semiconductors, uh, silicon carbide, gallium nitride. And so being able to handle this common mode rejection up to that uh, level of 60 uh, kV common mode voltage, customers can see very clear signals, accurate measurements of up to 2.5 kilovolts of differential voltage. That's a very unique first and only uh, capability in the industry. Now at a a bandwidth of uh, a gigahertz, uh, there is a superior rise time of less than 300 picoseconds. 
So uh, in combination with uh, its common road re rejection, again, being able to see any signal, uh, particularly the fast rise and fall time of um, uh, many of the uh, switch mode power supply designs that are out there. I'd simply say inquire uh, with your NTES or test force uh, representative in terms of uh, technical demo, uh, quotation, or uh, other facilitations as far as uh, learning more about uh, our ISO view probe. Okay, thanks. And we have another question. One of the past questions was about how the 5 series scope can actually go up to 8 channels. Can you run through what is new about the 5 series scope? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there are um, many uh, different and uh, first in the market uh, features around the 5 Series uh, mixed signal oscilloscope. Uh, but firstly, um, it really enables the design engineer uh, more than ample uh, analog channels. So the scope offers uh, four, six, or eight channel options. Again, this is uh, unique uh, in the marketplace. Uh, it also offers something called flex channels, which is again very unique in that um, design engineer uh, can use one input to either be analog or eight uh, digital channels. So they can choose a configuration of uh, eight uh, analog channels or up to 64 digital. Um, underneath of that, it is a 12-bit vertical resolution scroll, uh, which can, at high res, uh, provide 16 uh, bits of vertical resolution, so absolute clarity in terms of the signal measurement and uh, visualizing insight. Uh, underneath of that, there are also some very uh, key features and benefits. So it's a uh, super fast, six and a quarter giga samples a second per channel across all channels. So in other words, um, you won't have any degradation of sampling speed, uh, even if you're using eight analog or 64 digital channels. Um, it has a super deep uh, standard record length of 62 and a half million records, which can be upgraded or supersized to 125 million, so double, with uh, a simple option upgrade uh, that fits at the bottom of uh, the scope. Lastly, is it is fully upgradable um, across a bandwidth, options, advanced measuring uh, capabilities like jitter and power. So again, um, I'd, I'd only suggest that the, the audience uh, who uh, may want to learn more about a 5-series uh, mixed signal oscilloscope, please contact your test or test force representative. Um, they have ample inventory, uh, demo stock, uh, to provide a technical demonstration uh, and or provide uh, a request for quote. That's it for today. So thank you, Wilson, for a great presentation. And for those of you who attended, we will be sending out a copy of the recording so that you can watch it again uh, or you can share it with any of your colleagues. And thank you very much for your attention and participation today during the Q&A session as well. If you have any questions that come up at a later point in time, don't hesitate to reach out to us at Test Force. You can reply to my email or you can contact me easily by emailing support at testforce.com. I hope you all have a great day and I look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you very much.